Our scripture reading this morning is Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 28, and can be found on the page 1119 in the Pew Bibles. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of his word. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Let us pray. Gracious God, you speak to us in so many ways. Speak to us in this moment now, whether it be through the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, or somewhere in the space in between. Amen. So this morning we are continuing, actually we are concluding, our series on looking at life's journeys. And we've been doing this for the last few weeks. And, and this, this week we're, we're going to look at one of the most essential ones. As a matter of fact, it could actually, it is arguably the journey of faith itself. This is the journey that we take from brokenness to wholeness. Now, brokenness is one of those universal experiences. Never mind unicorns or the Sasquatch or even the Loch Ness Monster, the rarest of all creatures, possibly so rare that it does not even exist, is the adult human who does not experience brokenness, who carries no baggage from the past that now affects their present. And our brokenness can show up in so many different ways, more ways than we might even realize. Sometimes it's, it's short-lived. Sometimes it's ongoing. It can be acute or chronic. For some, brokenness just may be a momentary body blow that just knocks us off our feet. But for others, Brokenness can be absolutely crippling and can keep us from fulfilling our true potential. For those of us in the latter category, I don't know if there's anybody else in the room other than me, but just in case, for those of us in the latter category, the story of the legendary racehorse Seabiscuit resonates more than most. I don't know if you've seen the movie about his life, but if you have, you know what I'm talking about. Because it's the kind of story that draws us in and gives us hope that we can actually make that journey from brokenness to wholeness. Now, if you don't know his story, or if you have forgotten it, Seabiscuit's story takes place during the Great Depression. It's a true story. And it's at a time when the entire nation felt fundamentally broken. Everyone was in need of a hero. Everybody needed somebody to cheer for at a time where there just didn't seem to be anything to cheer for. And they got exactly what they needed 
In the collective form of, and this is to paraphrase a line from the movie, in the collective form of a horse that was too small, a jockey that was too big, a trainer that was too old, and an owner that was too dumb to know the difference. Now, Seabiscuit's owner was a car maker named Charles Howard. Now, Charles made a great deal of money. It was the, it's right about the transition early when he started to make his money. When the transition was made from, from mostly horse tra as horses as a means for transportation to cars. And so Charles made that, made that leap, and, he, and it became very lucrative for him. He became a car maker. Unfortunately... The same thing that brought him his fortune is what took the life of his son, who died in a car accident, and his young son. And Charles took a deep dive into the deepest depths of depression. And it also broke up his marriage. And Charles has, decides that he needs to go and just forget all of his troubles. He needs to take a vacation and get away from everything so he can forget everything. So he goes to Mexico. And when he's down there, he meets a woman who will become his second wife. But more importantly, she reintroduces him to joy in general, but also the joys of horses. And because of that, he decides that he might want to get into the racing business too, even though he has no idea where or how to start. But while he's in Mexico, he meets a man named Tom Smith. Tom is a really quiet man. Now he did not he did not weather the transition from horses to the to the horseless carriages of the cars. He did not weather that transition well and he resents it deeply. He would rather lay out in the lay out in on the ground on the bare ground looking up at the stars. He would rather that than be any kind of place near technology. It's just moving too fast for him. But the first time Charles lays eyes on Tom he sees him, there, there's a group of men trying to subdue a lame horse. who still has quite a bit of spirit, but they're trying to subdue him and hold him down so that they can, they can basically put him down. Tom, this is what Charles sees, sees Tom do. Tom walks in very calmly, and he offers to buy the horse to avoid him being put down. And Charles is impressed. By this, by this quiet strength that Tom shows. And so he knows he needs to get to know this guy. And on their very first meeting, Charles knows that Tom is exactly the man that he needs to manage his stables. Howdy. Hello. You hungry? No, no thanks. I'm fine. Charles Howard. Tom Smith. Nice to meet you, Tom. What's, uh, what's in his bandage? Oh, that's, uh, Hawthorne Root. It increases circulation. You want to sit down? Oh, all right. Thank you. <coughs> Will he get better? Already is, a little. Will he race? No, not that one. So why are you fixing him? Because I can. Every horse is good for something. Dude, he could be a cart horse or a lead pony, and he's still nice to look at. You know, you don't throw a whole life away just because he's banged up a little. We live in such a disposable society, don't we? It's one that worships all things new, shiny, and unblemished. And it tosses aside things once they have those very same new, shiny, and unblemished things. The minute they show the slightest bit of damage, our society just teaches us to toss those things aside. 
And the damage could come through just regular use, possibly overuse, and then, of course, sometimes abuse. That's just how we've learned to live our lives. And that mindset has bled into so much, into every part of those lives in some way or another. It influences our behavior and, and, and everything we do, just that mindset. We spend so much time and money and energy trying to hide our blemishes in whatever form they might present themselves. It might be a blemish on something that we own. It might be a blemish on our reputation. It might be a blemish on something else, or it just might be a blemish on us. But we try so hard to hide those things. And I guess that's probably because somewhere we are afraid that we might somehow be considered disposable too. If somebody notices how banged up we are. Even the way we think about our salvation is subject to the gravitational pull of this mindset. Oh, sure, we hear about it. We talk about it. We might even teach about it. Like from Paul in the Roman scripture, a little further than where we left off today, but a little further in Romans 8, we hear, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is, this is what we're taught from the very beginning as Christians. This is, this is what we are taught this is what we are told to believe, that, that above all else, God sees us as creatures of infinite value and worth, who loves us unconditionally, that God would do absolutely anything for us, including taking on human flesh and suffering, just so we could see the love of God in action. That is how much God loves us. And we are told this from the very, very beginning and all throughout. But then we get banged up a little, a little broken. And we start to feel like damaged goods. Before too long, we may even feel discarded or tossed aside, written off. Or maybe we just think we should be. Because when we feel like we're no good to anyone, we start to wonder if, okay, so salvation is available, is offered to all who will receive it, but maybe our name has just been left off that list. Or maybe we just go ahead and cross our own name off that list because we think that we are too broken to be saved. Anyway, back to Seabiscuit. Tom is, as you can tell, a really unconventional trainer. But his instincts when it comes to horses is beyond comparison. And when he meets Seabiscuit for the very first time, he says that Seabiscuit looked right through him. And he knew that he was something special. Even though Seabiscuit had also clearly been banged up quite a bit. Tom didn't care, though. The movie's narration says that the first time he saw Seabiscuit, he was walking through the fog at 5 a.m., in the morning. He was a small horse. He was hurting. There was a limp in his walk, a wheezing when he breathed. But Tom didn't pay any attention to that. He was looking the horse in the eye, and he knew. There was absolutely no doubt in his mind that Charles needed to buy that horse. Now, Seabiscuit for his part, he didn't come by his ragged appearance by accident. He came from a strong lineage. He really did. But he preferred loafing, to say the least. He, he liked to eat, and he liked to lay around. And he was also pretty small. But because of all that, he was written off as difficult and untrainable. And so his keepers began to severely mistreat him. Not the least of which was that he was relegated to being what they call a pacer horse. And so they would put him in the, in the, on the track with other horses. And what they would do is they would hold Seabiscuit back. So he intentionally to lose so that the other horses would get 
more confidence, and they would be then they would win the whole, the, the races, and because of that, in the few races that Sea Biscuit was actually entered into that he was supposed to win, he didn't because that's what he was he was trained to lose, so he lost, which only brought more mistreatment on him. Sea Biscuit was pretty mistreated. Nonetheless, Tom knows what he saw in Seabiscuit's eyes. He just couldn't figure out how to bring it out of him. But he did know that he needed to assemble the right team. And the final piece of that team was a jockey. And so he met a jockey named Red Pollard. And he knew he was the right one because Red had the same look in his eyes that Seabiscuit had. Red seemed to understand Seabiscuit on a level that few others did. And that was probably because Red was profoundly broken in his own right. Red was essentially abandoned by his family because of the Great Depression. And it was a source of deep pain and brokenness for him for the rest of his life. He always felt like he was going to be tossed aside and abandoned if he didn't if he still wasn't useful to whoever it was that his family was. And so Red had developed his own difficult personality, which had brought about his own set of troubles in his life. In other words, Red was just as banged up as the rest of them. Red fit in perfectly with this little band of misfits that was forming. And you know, our wounds can have tremendous power over us even if they aren't visible, and even if we're not really sure why they are there. And since we may not remember a time when they weren't there, we just automatically believe the things that our wounds try to tell us. Things about who we are. Things about our worth. They try to tell us that we are irredeemable messes. Hopeless causes. And trying to be any different is just pointless. That's what our wounds try to tell us. But then we hear the words of the psalmist. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are beautiful. I know that full well. And we start to let something seep into our thinking. Something that we are afraid is too good to be true. But my brothers and sisters, is more true than anything, anything that any of your wounds will try to tell you. The truth is, we were created whole, not broken. We were created beautiful, not damaged. No matter how banged up we are, we were still created out of God's love and grace. And as such, we are still expressions of God's love and grace. This is what defines us. This is who we are. Sometimes we just need to be reminded of that. Seems pretty fast. Yeah, in every direction. Hell, he's so beat up, it's hard to tell what he's like. I just can't help feeling they got him so screwed up running in a circle, he's forgotten what he was born to do. He just needs to learn how to be a horse again. Well, how do you do that? How far do you want me to take him? Charlie stops. Okay. That seems like a pretty good ride. Hope so. Thank you. 
When Tom says, he's so beat up, it's hard to tell what he's like, that hits us on levels deeper than we even might know we have. Somewhere along the way, along the way we've lost track of who we are and who we were created to be, even if we don't ever remember knowing in the first place. Because brokenness happens. Damage happens. They are as inevitable as sin and death are to the human condition. Dreams shattered, hopes crushed, relationships crumbling, fears, failures, shame. Whether it's due to circumstances beyond our control or our own bad choices. Our world collapses around us, and along with it goes our sense of identity or place in it. And whether we realize it or not, whether we want to admit it or not, without healing, those cracks are just going to widen, and the brokenness is just going to grow. But in no way does that mean that we should try to hide our brokenness. As a matter of fact, doing that only makes the damage even worse. Sometimes it's only in naming and accepting our brokenness that we can truly begin to heal. And even though we may be foundationally different from what, from what we were in the very beginning, before we were broken, regardless, we will be made whole. We will be on our way to wholeness. After Seabiscuit remembered, or was reminded, of what it's like to be a horse again, he began to win races. A lot of races. In fact, he started winning races that he had no business even being entered in in the first place, because he didn't know that there was anything wrong with him. He remembered who he was. Against all odds, little Seabiscuit, that perpetual underdog, he did become the hope of a nation. And he became internationally known. But, and and this, was, this was a nation that needed something, needed hope for, it, for some reason, needed hope over adversity. And Seabiscuit had become that. And along the way, Seabiscuit and his human team they started to learn as much about themselves as they did about each other. And even when they were faced with their own personal struggles, they never stopped doing what it, whatever it took to bring the best out in each other. Even if they felt like hopeless causes, they knew that the other one wasn't. They never stopped wanting the other to be made whole again. They never stopped working towards that. Now, right before... One of their biggest races, Red so suffers a horrible injury. And it's one that doctors aren't sure he'll fully recover from. In fact, they're pretty sure he won't recover from this injury. But he doesn't want to bring down the whole team. And so he's got this good friend of his, as an old friend. His name is George Wolf. They've known each other for years and years and years. And George is a fantastic jockey. And he trusts George. And so he tells, he tells the team that they should hire George to, to, to ride for him when he can't. And the night before that big race that I mentioned, Red takes George aside, and he tells George one of the biggest lessons that Seabiscuit ever taught him. It's the lesson of transformation. He tells him how Seabiscuit has taken his former brokenness and made it his greatest strength. Because see, it turns out, remember when I told you how they used to pull Seabiscuit back to make him lose all the time? It turns out that that didn't make him a loser, it made him a fighter. 
And instead of it making him lose hope, it sparks a fire in him. And so Red tells George that if he wants Seabiscuit to give him his all, all he has to do is he just has to pull back long enough to come eye to eye with his competitor. And something about that just reminds Seabiscuit of who he is. And Seabiscuit does the rest. And so George, he gives it a shot. That, fir that, that race, that big race, he gives it a shot. It's against all of his instincts, but he gives it a shot. And sure enough, Seabiscuit just takes off and wins the race and continues to do that. Seabiscuit truly was a fighter. But before too long, sadly, he also suffers an injury. And this one is going to be a career-ending injury. But that didn't matter to the ones that had become his family, to the ones that had truly loved him, to Charles and Tom and mostly Red. They didn't care if he could never race again. They just wanted to bring him home, make him happy, because he was a member of the family. And so they bring him back to where Red was also convalescing. And so Red and Seabiscuit, they spend all their time in the sweetness and the silence of the countryside helping each other get better. And amazingly, through both Red, though, amazingly, through the, 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 the time that they're spending together, both Red's and Seabiscuit's bodies, they do start to heal. And they heal to the point that Red even thinks that maybe they might be able to race again. He just kind of floats the idea, and it gets a lot of resistance at first, but he's sure. He's sure. And so against all of the better judgment, the rest of the team agrees, and Seabiscuit is entered into what, honestly, they are pretty sure is going to be the last race of his life. Now, the public is overjoyed. The public needed this, and they think it's spectacular. But when the race starts, it looks a lot like Red and Seabiscuit may not have been as strong and ready as they thought. You know, everybody thinks we found this broken down horse and fixed him, but we didn't. 
He fixed us. Every one of us. And I guess in a way, we kind of fixed each other too. It's interesting how God doesn't answer our prayers. God gives us answers to prayers. And I realize that sounds like the same thing, but it's not. Because take Seabiscuit and Red and Charles and Tom. Each was wounded. Their brokenness ordered their steps and guided their paths. Now, God certainly could have intervened. God could have just reached right in and made the necessary tweaks to, to bring them out of their brokenness, to fix them. God could have done that. But the problem is that they might have not noticed. And the fact is that they would not have been transformed. As a matter of fact, they might have not only not been transformed by God's work in their lives, but they might have thought that they had something to do with it. But instead of fixing them that way, God gave them the fix. And it came in the form of community, a family, a group of people that we can hang on to and cling to, Ones that look at us, and no matter how broken we might feel, when we see ourselves reflected back in their eyes, we see that we are loved and we are of value. They needed each other, and they needed, more importantly, each other to be whole. And so, and so they accepted each other as they were giving each other enough space not only to understand their own brokenness, but also to be made whole. Because it's not the same path for all of us. And we need that space and that encouragement to find out what it is in our lives and for us. Seabiscuit fulfilled his purpose of becoming a world champion. And more importantly, the beautiful, beautiful horse that he was. Red found people that would never, ever abandon him, that would never give up on him no matter what. He found his family. Charles found a way to climb out of his depression and grief, and Tom reclaimed his life's passion, bringing out the best in people and in horses. Each of them had been healed because the others refused to consider them disposable and discard them at the first sign of their brokenness. Each reached out to the other with the hand of God, encouraging them to become whole through grace and unconditional love and forgiveness. Making the journey from brokenness to wholeness is not a solo flight. It is not. We will never make it if we try to do it alone. Because whether or not we realize it, we're worth saving, no matter how much we are banged up. And sometimes it is only when somebody else tells us that, that we truly believe it. And we can't fully embrace how much we are worth for ourselves. Even if we can't do that, we have to embrace it for each other. We have to. We have to have others do that for us so that we, and, and that we do that for others particularly the people that we are closest to, the people that we care about the most. Because God can use us through our brokenness, and God can heal our brokenness. We just have to open our hearts to the possibility of it. Open our hearts to the possibility that we can be made whole again 
and that God truly does believe that we are worth it. May it be so in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.